everything that you and I have ever received in our lifetime must come through Jesus. Every time that there's a miracle, Jesus is the one who's made it possible. Everything that you and I receive in this place of worship today must come through Jesus. Worship him, adore him. John said, I heard. I heard the song of the redeemed, as they sang. Hallelujah. Worship. Seated, oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. You came so early again today. You know that, don't you? 
How many guys you got in? Say, mm-hmm. <laughs> Look around and be dead sure that you got in the... Are you sure that this is the place that you wanted to attend today? Look around. It's suddenly you realize you've gotten to something that you weren't expecting to get into. Leave now because there are thousands on the outside wanting your chair, wanting your seat. Well, sir, you know, uh, the first time I came to Dallas, the, Tulsa. <laughs> do, 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 do you want to know something? It's gotten so that I keep going so much. When I wake in the middle of the night, I, I think, now where am I? <laughs> what state, where am I? One of these days, I'll find myself coming when I should be going and going when I should be coming. If only you could know my heart. I feel very honored. I feel privileged to have on this stage today, Oral Roberts, a man whom I admire very much. <laughs> Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, come here, come here, come here, Oral. Come here, Oral. Standing everywhere, all of his auditorium. Everybody standing, all of his <laughs> Thank you. I want you to know, I appreciate you being here today. I want you to know how much I appreciated the fact that you made possible this great auditorium. I feel that, that too was in the will of God. I want you to know how much I appreciate your years and years of service. And I'd like to feel that we're in it together. And it's just like that. Give him a great big go. The first honorary doctorate that this university ever conferred on anyone was to be conferred upon the one in the nation of the world that we felt best exemplified the ministry of healing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was Catherine Kuhlman. The day that the members of the Board of Regents and I sat in one of the rooms on this campus and prayed and dreamed about this building, we emptied our billfolds and put on the table what we had on our persons, $232, and voted to build a building that cost $11 million. And I don't know if prayers ever get tall or not, but we were stretching. <laughs> to pray those prayers that God would give us this building. And Catherine, it's worth it all. Dr. Kuhlman, it is worth it all <laughs> to have you here today, not only in this beautiful maybe sitter, which is named in honor, in honor of a man and woman whom I knew and loved before they passed on, not only be glad to have you in this building, but upon this campus, because Jesus Christ is so real in you, and he's so real in us. He's our Lord, and we love him with all our heart. It's true. And Oral Roberts is still in action. Thank you. Well, Governor No, you're here someplace. Where are you, Governor No? God love you, Governor. <laughs> Just want to 
wanted you to know those were great catfish and peaches she sent me. <laughs> oh, that was the best catfish. And thank you for sending the recipe along too. <laughs> Don't listen, we're just having a little personal time here. And those peaches were a knockout, Governor. Good to see you. How are you? Behaving yourself, huh? You're better as long as I'm praying for you. You better, I'll tell you that. Oh, it's so nice to see you again, Governor. Bless you. And say, Captain the Beer, I haven't seen you, but Captain the Beer is here someplace. Where are you, Captain the Beer? Here he comes. It's Captain the Beer is see ya. What'd you do, Captain? They tell me you chartered a plane from Houston. We had to get us a plane. We couldn't get any buses. Really? They ran out of buses in that area. <laughs> I find that, that it's true. Others have told me yes. that all the buses are filled, everything. Don't tell me that people are not hungry for the spiritual. <laughs> they are. That's right. And so you mean, Captain, you, 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 you just chartered a bus, a, a plane, yes. and here you came. Yes. They gave us, uh, they would um, not give us the whole plane, even at that. How so many you have? Ninety. Ninety on the plane? Yes, besides those that came in cars. Don't you know you're a Baptist? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Don't you know you're a Baptist deacon? Yes. Don't you know you're a Baptist and are you still in good standing? I was the last time I was there, <laughs> we, we went to Houston for a meeting in the uh, big auditorium there. And you want to know something? I believe that the whole police force, when they drove up, I thought they were having a policeman's convention, believe me. <laughs> and all the men were in uniform, all the men from the Houston police force, uh, paying tribute to one of their own members, Captain LeBeer has been on the police force there for 30, years. 37 years. That's right. And I do not believe that there will ever be a healing again that will uh, mean more to Billy Graham and his staff than this man's healing because Captain LeBeer served uh, as the security officer for the Billy uh, Graham team. And you know something? I'll tell you something. We laugh about it now, but it wasn't a laughing matter then. This man didn't believe in women preachers. <laughs> totally unscriptural. He didn't believe in divine healing. Miracles were all right back there. But not today. You know, it's the most amazing thing in the world how people can change their theology so quickly <laughs> when they're desperate. How many know what, what it's like? Keep your hands down. That's right. <laughs> because some of you may have to change your theology too. But when he came face to face with cancer, and, and it was... Uh, it was documented. I mean, there it is. Cancer, what part of the body? Well, it started in the prostate area. And before I got to the Catherine Kuhlman meeting, it spread to two other areas of my body. It went from the prostate to the hip and from the hip to the spine. I had carcinoma. And there wasn't any doubt about my condition. I had the finest cancer doctors in the world today. You know, Houston is a cancer center. And we have fine cancer doctors. And you know, I can't get over what my <laughs> cancer doctors had to say about at this afterwards. <laughs> it was such a wonderful thing, for they didn't think that I could live, you know. They told me that I couldn't even live a year. In December of 1968, this is when they found this condition. I thought I was so healthy, and then it hit me all at one time. Uh -huh. And then, in February of 1971, I attended a service at the Shrine Auditorium. I shall never forget that day, for I have never been the same since, in a number of ways. One, I was seated way in the balcony. That's what I tell people, don't feel, feel yeah. badly if you have to sit way off. I was right in the balcony, 
And when you pointed your hands to where I was seated and said, you came a long ways for your healing of cancer, God has healed you. Stand up in the name of Jesus Christ and claim the healing. Well, now, I'm a Baptist, and I'm a deacon in a Baptist church. <laughs> and, you know, I sat there, and I was dying, and I knew that I was dying. I knew that I was on my last go-around. Yeah. Well, I had already got my house in order to leave. I, I was so weak, I could just put one foot in front of the other. And then when you call that healing out, and I said, oh, Lord, of course I want to be healed, but what should I do? You know, I, and something within me said, stand up, stand up. Well, I've come this far. What, why shouldn't I stand up? I stood up, and at that instant that I stood up, it was just like someone had poured a bucket full of energy right down on top of me. Just like turning a light switch on on the wall, for I went from no energy to energy plus just that fast. And I've never been the same since that day that I stood up. Praise God. It was that simple. when my doctors look at me and they just recently the last time this doctor looked at me he says you know I have no medical explanation for you at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> he said in fact I stand in your presence a little bit fearful and I said my goodness why now this is doctor is one of the ten outstanding carcinoma doctors in the world today dr. Lowell Miller he said I stand in your presence a little bit fearful and I said why he said, because I know something happened to you. And I said, praise God, that's right, something did happen to me. <laughs> oh, listen, it's been so wonderful, and I just can't tell enough people how wonderful God has been to me. And to thank him for someone who has been such a beautiful vessel to bring this about. Now, I know where my healing came from. But I thank God for Catherine Kuhlman. I couldn't thank him, thank him enough for you. And I know there are thousands of people that pray for you each day. And I'm one of those people who pray for you daily. And just that the Lord will continue to show people who believe that miracles don't exist, that they do exist today. And you know what I tell people when I stand before them, what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me, He'll do for you, yeah, and I know yeah, that, yeah, yeah. and I know the need is great, uh -huh. and I just thank God that miracles are still happening. Y you know thank it from God. experience. Yes. Your theology changed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm still a Baptist, but I'm a different kind of a Baptist. Give him a great thing! <laughs> There may be a lot of you going out of here today, a different kind of a Methodist, a different kind of a Presbyterian. Just sit there with an open heart and an open mind. That's all. Away up there, away up there. Don't feel badly that you're away up there. We should have the rapture before the service is over with. You'll get up there sooner than the rest of us. So don't feel bad about Away up there. God bless you. Are you hearing me perfectly all over the auditorium? Is there anyone who cannot hear say amen? Come see me after the service. I'll pray for your hearing. <laughs> this is a marvelous auditorium. Oral Roberts, it represents you. Everything you do, you do well.
thank you. I want you to know how much I personally appreciate the fact. Oh, Dr. Metcalf, come here. Oh, do, don't go away. Here's Dr. Metcalf, been with the ministry 18 years. Give him a great big applause. Bye bye. Our own Dr. Metcalf. I know how you feel about him. So do we. 18 years. The Englishman, every drop of blood in his veins is English, I'll tell you. On top of that Presbyterian. And I'll never forget the very first time I saw him slain by the power of a Holy Ghost right down, right on the floor. And he's never been the same since. I want you to know here is another gentleman who does not believe in women preachers. <laughs> but he's been hanging around one for 18 years. And I want you to know how much I appreciated this wonderful gentleman, our own Dr. Metcalf, and the talent that has been Jimmy Methodist, Charlie Methodist. Oh, Charlie. When he started out with me, he had hair. <laughs> Jimmy's was very black. Mine remains the same shade. You want to know something? There are men on this platform that I appreciate very much. Dr. Thomas, I want you to know how much I appreciate you. Dr. Thomas, I want you to know, I could never begin to tell you how much I thank God for our first contact. Dr. Thomas, who is one of the great pastors here in Tulsa, he had everything to gain and nothing to lose, and yet he could have lost everything, really, had he not been in the will of God. When I was here in Tulsa before, and he opened his church, the Methodist Church, here in, it's the first United Methodist Church here in Tulsa, and asked me to speak to his people regarding the Holy Spirit. That was the beginning of a whole new world to you. Come here, doctor. <laughs> doctor Thomas, who took his stand when he took it, he had everything to lose. But remember something, he has lost nothing. And I want to say this, I want you to understand this, and I'm saying it for the benefit of every pastor in this place. Those of you who are so afraid of the Holy Spirit, those of you who are just on the borderline, here is the pastor of a marvelous taking his stand for the deeper things of the Spirit. He has lost nothing, but has gained everything. Give Dr. Thomas a great big applause. Come here, Reverend Mr. Holden, come here. I want Reverend Mr. Holden of the First Baptist Church. Where are you? Dr. Holden of the First Baptist Church. He's here someplace in the audience who's been so wonderful. All of you pastors who've been, have cooperated. I can't call any more of you because it would seem as though I was partial. 
but you men have stood behind this ministry. But here is one preacher I just found out. Maggie came to the dressing room and she said, what is your name, sir? The, the, the one who preached for 30 some years, you've never been converted. You hoo Don't all stand up. Just, just uh, <laughs> Reverend LaBelle, where are you? You hear some, oh no, come on down here. G -g come on down here. This <laughs> come on, from St. Luke's United, Methodist Church, am I right? right. St. Luke's. <laughs> and I'll tell you, St. Luke was mighty glad when he got converted. <laughs> Come here. How many years were you in the ministry without being converted? 39 years. <clears throat> well, what did you preach about? Oh, just about everything. <laughs> You really did, huh? <laughs> and you knew nothing about conversion? Well, I knew, but uh, you know how it is. You get used to following the... No, business. I don't know how it is. You no, don't. no, I don't. <laughs> well, maybe I better tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you get used to following the ritual and following the bulletin and uh, following everything else. That's what you should be following. But God had a marvelous way of bringing me around to what I had experienced recently. Last year, when you were in, in St. Louis <laughs> at uh, the Keel Opera House, I was sitting there in this back brace that I had worn for a number of years. I've worn out two of these. This is a third one. I, I had a ruptured disc that was pressing into my spinal column, and I was living in pain. And for all the years that I suffered that intense pain, I wondered how much longer I could stay in the ministry and uh, fill my pulpits and do my pastoral work. Well, what did you expect when you came to, to the service? Well, I really didn't know what to expect. I, uh, I just figured if I could get there, maybe something would happen to me. And the first night that I got there, you were there two nights, September the 18th and the 19th, 1972. And the first night I was there, I was uh, so taken back and so amazed at watching the miracles and seeing people go forward and give themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Had you never seen anything like it? Yeah. No, not, not in all my life. Yeah. And so I just got under conviction sitting there. Really? And, and I just uh, more or less slumped over in my seat, and I started praying, asking the Lord Jesus Christ to be very, very real to me. And well, you I, converted that night. Yes, yes, I was really transformed that night. I really experienced something because sitting on my right was a spirit-filled Episcopalian, <laughs> and uh, sitting on the other side was a spirit-filled uh, Lutheran from the Missouri Synod, and there were four spirit-filled uh, Catholic sisters behind me, and uh, <laughs> you, you, you didn't never, have a chance to get I didn't have a chance because there were four or five spirit-filled people sitting in front of me, <laughs> from various churches, and so they all turned around and they laid hands on me and prayed for me, and that night I really experienced a marvelous transformation. Well, I wasn't healed that night, so I wrote Miss Kuhlman a letter and told her that I had experienced something in my soul that I had never had before in my life, and I felt like it was going to transform my life and my ministry and my church. And then I went back the second night, and. She uh, looked down in the center section and said, there's someone, there's a man sitting down here in the center section about eight rows back that has on a back brace that he's worn for a number of years. God has healed you. Get up and give God the glory. What did you do? And, uh, oh, it just felt like ice cubes had, uh, <laughs> had, had been pouring down my back. And uh, I knew that I was healed. And I praise God that I was able to get out of this thing because I had worn it for a number of years, this section down here held that third lumbar disc in place and this section up here see this is heavy steel coated with leather and this held my spine in place in a certain area and this came around my rib cage and I fastened it the top and the bottom I could hardly sit stand or walk in it. three of these this yes, is third. this is my third one see I had this affliction since I was 17 years of age and for 38 years I waited for something like this to happen. 
I couldn't bend over, I couldn't lift anything heavy, I couldn't stoop, I couldn't do anything but just walk around miserably in this thing. And if I did just happen to turn over in the bed in the wrong uh, place or uh, make the wrong type of a turn, uh, it would be another trip to the hospital, six weeks in traction. And I was just miserable, really. Were you healed instantly? I was healed instantly that night. I felt, it just felt like uh, ice cubes had been poured down my back and I felt that disc go back in place. But the amazing thing about it is when I went back to uh, Dr. Lee Ford in St. Louis, Missouri, who fitted me to the last back brace, he took the x-rays and saw what terrible condition I was in. He had to help me up on the examination table to look at me and he would run his thumbs up and down my spine and press into that ruptured disc and I would just yell and scream and almost go up to the ceiling. But after I was healed, I went back for him to take additional x-rays and he was amazed at what he saw. He put the x-rays side by side and he said that ruptured disc that has been out of place had, you see, it was wafer thin. It was just wearing thin down through the years. And that when it was wafer thin, it kept pressing into my spinal column and, and making so much pain through, through, through my nerves. And um, it, I, I, I had terrible headaches just unbearable headaches. I couldn't read, I couldn't study, I couldn't, oh, I would just go blind. Many times I would just pull over to the side of the road and park the car and maybe call my wife to come and get me because of these terrible blinding headaches and this awful condition in my back. But after I was healed, Dr. Ford uh, looked at those x-rays and he said, not only has that disc gone back into place, but it has regrown to its normal thickness. God did it. <laughs> That's the way I believe in divine healing. That's the way. Remember, you go back to your doctor and have it verified. Say, so what about yeah. your church after you got born again? Well, my <laughs> church was thrilled. My church was happy. Would you, would and, you go back and preach um, about oh, it? They, oh, I went back and I really got into the word of God and started preaching. My goodness. I lived in this for years, now I'm living in the Word of God. Go on, <laughs> give him a break! Yes, ma'am, and remember again, when the power of God begins falling the healing of sick bodies, if there are members of the medical profession, come and examine any of these people. Maggie came back and, uh, you see, I never get out to talk cause, uh, and... and Everything that I get, Maggie comes back to the dressing room and she said the place is loaded with people who've been healed. And she began calling out from this place, from that place, from St. Louis, from Kansas City, from everywhere. But there is one woman who is here. Uh, I'm going to just look at her. Arlene from Little Rock, Arkansas. See, you're here from practically every state in the union today. Do you know that? If we had the time, I, I would just like to check up and find out the different states. Everybody's here. Everybody is here, and everybody who's not here is wishing they were here. Arlene from Little Rock, Arkansas. I think I'm right on that. Multiple sclerosis. Where are you, honey? Maggie said you're here someplace. Come here. Come here. Come here. And this is the last one I'm going to take. We're just loaded with people all over this place who have been healed by the power of God. This is glorious. Arlene, multiple sclerosis. Praise God. I'm here today after having multiple sclerosis for over a decade. I had a nurse with me constantly for over two years. I had convulsive episodes that were death-threatening. The whole body would just stiffen, and I progressed to such a point that I was uh, so uncoordinated it was even difficult for me to eat. I was like this, you know, I, my speech was really strange. I mean, to get a sentence out, people struggled to pull with me. And it was just something else to watch other people doing for my family and watch other people going to church. And I say watch, even that was double vision. But God led me through a series of circumstances including your book, I Believe in Miracles. And you've never been to a miracle service. Never been to a miracle service, but I, I believe God for anything. But uh, a doctor originally sent me the book, I Believe in Miracles. You, you mean a doctor? A doctor 
Uh, from so California. Our doctor sent you our book, I believe, in Miracle. Right, and on the flyleaf, he and his right, wife had written, We are praying for you for healing. Love, Tom and Judy. And that little book is stuck in my mind. And would you know, God is so good that if we don't get the message the first time, he repeats it. So I got that book over and over, maybe four, five, six times. Other people said Other you. Other people gave me the same book over and over. <laughs> and finally, I got the message that God, you know, was still doing miracles and that he what, was what watching church me. did you belong to? St. Luke's United Methodist Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. Sometimes it takes a message. <laughs> it's a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, was laying flat on my back in the bed. I had been in bed for a number of months because my body was so weakened that I had had a complete IV heart block. And I uh, did not even get up to eat meals anymore. And that little book was laying by my bed. A neighbor came over, saw it, picked it up. She says, I've got one called God Can Do It Again. And we changed books. The next day there was a conversation. She, and she said, you know, I believe God's still doing those miracles. And I agreed. I said, you know, if, if I could just go to a Catherine Kuhlman service where there's a climate of faith, I know God can heal me too. And so would you believe the next day somebody came to my house and they just happened to know your schedule. And they said, did you know Miss Kuhlman is going to be in St. Louis next Tuesday? So I thought, oh, it was just like God had sent me a telegram. You know, it said, go to St. Louis. <laughs> Here's the lady God sent a telegram to. Was it kind of like that? It really was. I mean, I got, it was just got like, I got the message. And so I called my husband at work. I was so excited. I said, Gil, I said, I think God is leading me to go to St. Louis to a Catherine Kuhlman service. But uh, Gil didn't get the same message. <laughs> <laughs> He said, now, honey, he says, don't get excited. He says, you know, you could never make the trip. He says, you know, you just got out of the hospital, and you had this heart block, and you have convulsions, and you're uncoordinated, and you can't even sit up at the table and eat your meals. He says, do you really think, you know, that you should go to St. Louis? And so I insisted, so he came home so I wouldn't get all excited. And while he was sitting there, you know, telling me all the reasons, in the net, and there were good reasons why I shouldn't make this trip, God touched him and gave him a peace that I would be all right. So he, the Holy Spirit dealt with him because he loved me too, you know. And we came, and while I was sitting there in the auditorium, when you were talking about the Holy Spirit, I was so fascinated because in, uh, I had really never heard a complete message about the Holy Spirit. I believed in the Holy Spirit, but I had no idea of the power that was present for today. And I was so fascinated when you were talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and going through the Old Testament. I said, gee, I never noticed that before. I just didn't want to miss a word. And while I was listening so keenly, all of a sudden something inside said, you're well. You know, and that really startled me because I wasn't used to that either. And then I felt just like a, a little cool breeze just passed over my body. And I, I just was not looking for anything dramatic, you know, but from that point on, I got stronger and stronger and stronger. And during the service, my vision, which was double, became normal. And I reached out my hands, and the trembling was gone, and the coordination was back, and I realized I was sitting up on the edge of my seat with no support at all, you know, and it was, you know, I wasn't even eating my meals at the table. So that was pretty good, you know, and everything from September 19th, 1972, has been absolutely just beautiful. And I tell you, the walk with the Lord is beautiful, too. It is just great. Well, the doctor's amazing. The, my doctor nearly bit the end of his pipe off when I walked in. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, you want to tell me what happened? <laughs> Oh, sure. You know, I just didn't say a word. I was letting, you know, knock for reflexes. Everything is normal. Remember, this is multiple sclerosis, you know. <laughs> Everything was just normal, and, uh, you know, all this, yeah, I couldn't do this, you know, before. It was just impossible. I was going way out this side. And so he goes through all this. He says, do you want to tell me what happened? You know, and I said, do you believe in miracles? And he said, well, yes. He said, I've seen three cases in 25 years that I can't medically explain. He says, you're one of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just knew it was God because it was, actually, he was doing his best. I had wonderful doctors. He was one of the best neurologists. I mean, people consult him from states around. And actually, he was watching me getting progressively worse. 
And I was to the point where... And you where were instantly... Instantly healed. Instantly. Of multiple sclerosis. <laughs> I'm going to have to admit that's God put up a hand. This should be the greatest encouragement the, in the whole world to anyone here in this place with multiple sclerosis. Understand it to this very hour. I can't stand here and tell you how these things can be. She experienced it. Here she is, the one who had the experience. I'm supposed to be the preacher, but neither one of us can tell you anything more or less than the fact that it's God. It's just God. It's his mercy. Because I, That's right. I didn't deserve it, really. I, I, if people wait till they're good enough to come to the Lord, they'll never get there. <laughs> I might as well sit down. She's preaching a good sermon. <laughs> Give her a great day, God bless you. Yeah. 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 Really, we don't need a sermon today, you know that? The very atmosphere is electrified with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I hope that no one is in a hurry to get home. If you have an appointment, go now. I might as well tell you that, and, and please, if there are youngsters in the auditorium, we always have a rule and understanding with the ushers. I haven't told them yet, but I'm telling them now. That if any youngster even makes a peep. The mother or whoever has a youngster, you take your youngster to the first usher and he'll babysit with your youngster the rest of the service. <laughs> we never tell them that at an usher's meeting. <laughs> and the, the reason that we ask that is because there are people who come from so many, many miles, people who've made great sacrifices to be here. And it's unfair. And there's a youngster up there someplace. If somebody will take care of it, I'll appreciate it very much. Just then, all the ushers disappeared. <laughs> but you'll understand why. And don't feel that I'm being unkind in this. Please do not. And I just want to announce, because there are those who are asking where we're going to have the next service. We're going to be in Atlanta Thursday this week, in Atlanta, Georgia. But please do not come. We have more now than we can take care of. We're going to be there in the Civic Center Auditorium. We're going to be in St. Petersburg in the large Bayfront Center Arena on Monday, November the 5th. I'm only doing this. We're going to be in Chicago. November the 8th, we're going to be in New York City, November the 21st. And uh, I'm just saying because so many of you are asking. I'm only going to speak to you a very short time. The very presence of the Holy Spirit is very marvelous in this place. And I still believe it, and I believe it with every hour of my being that we're so near. The end of this dispensation, I believe it. That we're now seeing everything that happened in the early days of Pentecost, everything, when it was a perfect church, these same things are now being restored. There's one word that's very outmoded, and that word is revival. When a preacher stands in his pulpit and is still talking about a revival, he's missed the whole thing. We're not living in an hour of great revival. We're living in a day of great restoration. Glorious restoration. We're living now in the closing moments of the day of Pentecost, and the day of Pentecost comes to an end when the Holy Spirit leaves. And before we have the great catching up, before we have the last day of Pentecost, the last hour of Pentecost, 
I believe with every atom of my being that I shall live to see a miracle service when every wheelchair is emptied and every person in that place will be healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe that. There were services in the early church, read the word, when the word of God says, and they were all healed. I never walk out on a stage anymore, never, but what I wonder, is this that day? I'm going to read something. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. These are not drunken, as you may suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is. And this, my friend, this is that now. It's being publicized in every newspaper. It's being talked about around the world. Something that happened months ago and many of you have read about it. You've heard about it. I was the very last one to find out about it, really. Bolivia is considered one of the hardest nations to touch with the gospel. Anyone in missionary work, regardless of what your church affiliation might be, will tell you that Bolivia is one nation that has never been cracked with the gospel, never. A young Bolivian, only 20 years of age, from a very average Bolivian family, came to the United States as a pre-med student, registered at the Pasadena City College in Los Angeles. Someone invited him to the Shrine Auditorium where we were there for the service. Out of curiosity, he came. I do not know whether anyone to this very hour, I do not know whether anyone prayed with him. I do not know whether it was a personal worker. I do not know. I do not know the details, only the fact that he came, had never been in a service like it sitting there a pre-med student don't tell me god doesn't have a sense of humor and before that service is over with he received that beautiful spiritual experience that new birth experience he had never heard the gospel before he went out of the shrine auditorium so thrilled with what he had seen and that which he's heard The next month he came back again, but he didn't realize he had to come so early for a good seat. And when he got there for the next shrine meeting, the doors were locked. Because we have to lock the doors when 7,000 people are in, there are fire laws. When he got to there, the doors were locked and he couldn't get in. There were several thousand people on the outside standing there, unable to get in. And he was still so thrilled with his own marvelous experience. It was so beautiful, he didn't become discouraged. While I was on the inside of the Shrine Auditorium, preaching, he got himself a folding chair, and where he ever got that folding chair, no one will ever know. You understand, I have not to this very day, I have not spoken with him. That's the reason I can prove to you that I have nothing to do with these miracles. I'm the very last person to know about these miracles. Catherine Kuhlman has nothing to do with these miracles. I have nothing to do with these things that are happening today. Not one of you in this great auditorium has come to see Catherine Kuhlman. Not one of you. And no one knows any better than I. He got this folding chair 
standing on that folding chair, he began to tell those people the wonderful experience that he had had a month before. In broken English, he stood there and told them that for years he'd been seeking something to be satisfied. And while he was standing there telling them the best that he knew how of that which had happened to him, God in his tender mercy gave to him the gift of healing. Who can understand the mercy of God and the marvels of the thing to speak? He went back to Bolivia. When I was in New York City, someone gave me this, it's headlines. Holy Spirit outpoured in Bolivia. The president of Bolivia saved. This has just happened. wife of Bolivia has just been healed by the power of God. I have pictures that were given to me one week ago in Miami, Florida. The whole government is backing this young Bolivian as thousands upon thousands today to the very hour while I'm speaking to you of being saved by the power of God. Here is an actual picture that was given to me in Miami just a week ago. The smallest crowds to whom he speaks to are 70,000. No stadium. There's no stadium in Bolivia that is larger With this picture, he said one, and remember, I have not seen him. The back of the picture, he says, to my mom in the Lord, with love. I never dreamed I'd be the mother of a Bolivian son. <laughs> Greetings from your own son. Pray for me with love in Christ. This, my friend, hear me. This is that now. When I stood face to face with Pope Oh, it could not have happened 15 years ago. It could not have happened 12 years ago. It would have been impossible. But I remember well when Jim Murray, the head of a radio station, called me in one Monday morning, and he's very much Roman Catholic, and he said, Father so-and-so of St. Barnabas, called me in after mass and he said Jim who is Catherine Kuhlman we've had more people come into confessionals confessing they went to see Catherine Kuhlman who is she <laughs> sisters where are you Stand up, sisters. Go on, go on. Stand up, sisters. This, my friend, this, this is that now.
It could not have happened 10 years ago. It could not have happened eight years ago. A private audience with Pope Paul. When I entered standing, taking my hands in his, extending his hands to me and saying, I'm not only praying for you, you have my blessing. And we stood there, not as one being Catholic and one Protestant, but two people who love God and two people who love souls. And for the very first time they tell me when I was there in Ottawa, Canada, it was the first time that Catholic priests in Canada stood in their pulpits and asked their people to attend the services. <laughs> this, my friend, this is that now. For the very first time in my ministry, the very first time that I can remember, the other night in Miami, when the power of God began falling, I almost felt I was in the Jewish temple for 30 minutes, one right after another, one right after another. They came from the great audience saying, I'm Jewish, but I was healed. And immediately I would say, accept him as a true Messiah and without hesitation, one after another and one right after another. That's <laughs> it. Now, remember something. In this auditorium is the power of the Holy Spirit. I know the secret of these miracles. The same secret to the miracles during the ministry of Jesus. That's why I say to you in this place, some of you ministers are just on the borderline. I know this auditorium is filled with ministers of all denominations. If you forget everything else that I say in these next few minutes, remember one thing. You're standing there. You're afraid. You're afraid. If Jesus could trust the Holy Spirit, and he did, Jesus staked everything that he had on the Holy Ghost. Remember that. Never forget it. The Son of the Living God staked absolutely everything, and I do not mean to be sacrilegious when I word it just as I have. I mean it just as I've said. When Jesus walked this earth, he was as much man as he were not God. That's the reason he could have yielded to temptation. If Jesus could not have yielded to those temptations, then those temptations would have been a farce. secret of those miracles and the life and ministry of Jesus was the Holy Spirit. That same glorious resurrection power that walked into that tomb and raised Jesus from the dead. And when Jesus went away, this to me is so thrilling. Love is something that you do. You can't love without giving. You just cannot love without giving. 
You remember that wonderful conversation that Jesus had with the Father? When he reminded the Father, when he said, These that thou hast given unto me, the church, this glorious body of believers, these, Father, that thou hast given unto me, and you and I are God's gift to his Son, the church is precious. Oh, if you only knew how precious is the church. How precious is the bride of Christ if you could only understand. Sometimes we get glimpses of it. But often I wonder how many of us realize how precious is the church. It's God's gift to his son. How precious is the bride of Christ. It's the father's gift to his son. You can't love without giving, you can. That's the reason just before Jesus went away, he gave to the church the greatest gift that was possible for him to give. There was no greater gift that Jesus could give to his own. There was no greater gift that he could give to the church than the person who'd been so faithful, the one who'd not failed him. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What power? The same power that had been manifested in his ministry, in his life. The one who had not failed him. The one whose power was manifested. say that I am in substance, this is what he said, then believe me for the very work's sake. What works? The works of the Holy Spirit. And when he went away, he gave to the church the greatest gift possible for him to give. Everything that happened in the early church, hear me, beloved, should have been happening in the church, lo, these many years. Everything, the gift was there. It had been given to the church, it was there. But we have not accepted, we have not received the gift. Now the hour has come, and I want you to know that I believe that this is the church's greatest hour. We're living in the church's greatest hour. It's dark out there. For the world, it's dark and it's getting darker. And the greatest proof of the authenticity of the word of God is Bible prophecy. And if you're a newspaper man here tonight, if you're a part of the news media, I'm going to tell you something. If you really want to scoop, Start reading the Bible. I repeat to you, I told you the other day that I was invited by the Today Show when this thing of Marjo broke, you know. And the Today Show invited me to come to New York City and asked me to defend evangelism. I sent word back and I said thanks. I appreciate the fact that you would think of me. And 
ask me to do it. I'll come under different circumstances, but I'll not come under these circumstances, and I'll tell you exactly why. The Bible needs no defense. This word needs no defense. I do not have to defend the word. I do not have to defend Jesus Christ. I'm not up here defending Jesus Christ. I'm not up here defending the Son of God. I'm standing here before you. I'm not defending the Holy Ghost. Jesus needs no defense. God Almighty needs no defense. The Holy Spirit needs no defense. The one who fulfilled his word in the past is fulfilling it now. Nations are taking their places, even as God's word said they would, as men on a chessboard. Time is running out. It's getting dark and it's getting darker and darker and darker. The Bible says that the future holds a tribulation, not just suffering, but a tribulation, such as the world has never known and never will know again. But beloved, right now, he's getting his bride ready. He's getting the church ready. If I could only tell you, I would get that on my knees. I would get, I would do, I don't have the ability. I don't have the ability. These things are only supernaturally revealed. That's the reason Christianity is not a religion. Take it out of the category of religion. Christianity is a supernatural revelation. Know that. I have not the ability to give you the supernatural revelation. I do not. Only the Holy Spirit can give you that. But I pray that your understanding will be open this to the hour, to the moment in which we are living. Before every catastrophe, God has always sent a warning. He's merciful. He's tender. He's always sent a warning. And again, he's sending a warning. The Holy Spirit is about to leave. And when the Holy Spirit leaves, we come to the end of the time of the Gentiles. We begin the time when God keeps his earthly covenants to an earthly people and everything is shaping up in the Middle East exactly the way the word of God said it would. His church is not a defeated body. His church will never go out a defeated body. Hear me. And I wish I could stand on the highest mountain tops and proclaim it until every human being could hear it, know it, know it, know it. This is an hour of great restoration, not of revival. If nothing is happening in your church, then, my friend, I'll tell you something. Go to the nearest morgue and lie down. You're dead because the hour has come when things are happening. And if you're attending a church where nothing is happening, get out. And find one where the action is. So this is that in the now. This is that in the now. It's a lie. The very atmosphere is permeated with it. He's restoring all the fruits. He's restoring all the of the spirit of the church. An hour of great restoration. 
When the church goes out, beloved, it's going out the perfect church. When the bride meets the bridegroom, it will be a perfect bride. Something is happening. Something is happening. It's thrilling. It's exciting. No one knows any better than I. I tell you, I tell you that God's proof I don't have anything to do with these miracles. I have no healing virtue. I'm the most unlikely person in the whole world. To be standing here today. I know from whence I've come. A little crossroads town in Missouri, Concordia. For me to be standing here, the place where I'm standing in maybe auditorium today, I'm the most unlikely person in the world that should be standing here. I'll never get any glory for any consecration that I've ever made. Never. I'll never get any reward for any Consecration. Because I've never had to make a consecration because I never had anything to consecrate. I was born without talent. I was born without anything. It's easy to surrender when you have nothing to surrender. I had nothing. And one day I just looked up and said, Dear Jesus, if you can use nothing, then take nothing. Give nothing. That's the reason that you haven't come here to see Catherine. Not a person has come here to see me. I know it better than anyone else. You're here because you're hungry. You're here because you're seeking reality. There's something inside of you. It's crying out. You've got to be filled. There's something. There are people here. You wouldn't classify yourself as a spiritual person. Maybe you haven't been to church in years and you find yourself sitting here in this service. You look around and you wonder why you're here. It didn't just happen. These things are not just happening. This is that now. The Holy Spirit, she's getting the bride ready. He's getting the church ready. That's the reason he's pouring out of his spirit upon all flesh. Jew, Gentile, Catholic, Protestant, the man, the woman who's been an unbeliever all of his life, and yet there's this great coming out in this great call. I would not say that these miracles are a result of faith, because you'll find out that before this service is over with, there'll be those who come up on this platform, and they'll say, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. This couldn't happen to me. I can't believe it. It is mercy. We're living in an hour of mercy. 
We're living in an hour of great grace. He's pouring out of his spirit. He loves us. He loves us. That's why just sitting there, I can't explain it to you. I've told you everything that I know. I can't tell you more because I don't know anymore. I don't think there's anyone in this great auditorium today quite as hungry spiritually for the things of the spirit than the one who's standing before you. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with every atom of my being. I'm so dependent on the Holy Spirit. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But beloved, I'm going to tell you something. I believe that even after one has received that one experience, there's more and there's more and there's more and there's more. And sometimes I feel like a little child standing on the seashore, picking up a pebble here and picking up a pebble there. And then I look out and I see the great ocean that's there and there's more and there's still more. If only I knew better how to cooperate with the Spirit. How do you do it? I don't understand the slaying power of the Holy Ghost. I only know that I have nothing to do with it. I don't understand how it can be a woman with multiple sclerosis. I still stand there and listen to these people testify. I'm as amazed as the person who is hearing the testimony for the very first time. But I know better than anyone else that I have nothing to do with it. Sitting there, sitting there, and hear me this moment. It's the same Holy Spirit that's in this auditorium right now. It's the same Holy Ghost that came upon the 120 in that upper room. That's the same Holy Spirit. You read that glorious account in the Word of God and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It's the same person of the Holy Spirit that came upon the believers in the church. That early church is the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit. And he's about to leave. And when he goes, he takes with him the bride of the church. will not be here for the great tribulation for the tribulation is not for the perfecting of the saints our perfecting is being taken care of now he goes beyond faith eyes closed just a minute all over this place and an eye open while I was speaking the Holy Spirit has come upon many a person sitting there the Holy Spirit is moving in this place. The Holy Spirit is moving in this auditorium, this holy ground. As you sit there literally breathing of his presence, oh, there's such power and quiet. Breathe in this presence. Wouldn't it be glorious if this could be the service? When every person, the place would be healed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit who manifested his power the ministry of Jesus, the same Holy Spirit who healed all that were present in those early services of the church. You don't need Catherine Kuhlman to lay hands upon you. Just sit in there as the Holy Spirit moves. 
Say, have you ever seen the Holy Spirit? No. But I have seen the results of his presence. Neither hath any man seen the wind. But we see the results, the force of the wind. These marvelous healings are the result of the force and the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I only ask you, forget there's anyone else here. Forget there's anyone else here in this holy sanctuary. Forget that there's anyone else here. him that for which you have come and the very minute that you know that you're healed the very second that you know you owe it to him to come and give testimony of that which he has done for you the very second don't come forward to be prayed for Sit there, take it. <laughs>